everybody! Today we're talking about writing quirks and how to avoid them. A writing quirk is a pesky habit that sneaks into your manuscript. It's usually on a sentence level, something a line editor or copy editor might help you with. Every writer has quirks, myself included, but the goal is to eliminate or at least lessen them as much as possible. That's where I come in. I'm listing the 10 most common quirks I see in people's writing. A lot of this comes from my experience back when I used to critique people's novels, but some of these issues are things that I still see today in published works. Yikes. Before we get into it, I am super excited to announce that today's video is sponsored by Pro Writing Aid. Pro Writing Aid is an amazing platform that not only helps writers edit their work, but also helps them understand those edits so they can improve their craft. What I love about Pro Writing Aid is it's not just a basic spelling and grammar checker. Yes, it definitely has those features, but it's also a style editor as well as a source of education. It's not just going to point out passive voice, it's going to explain what passive voice is and why you should try to avoid it in the future. It has in-depth reports, articles, videos, and even quizzes that help you strengthen your writing and have fun along the way. That's why I prefer it to all other editing software. It's not enough for me to know that I made a mistake, I want to know why it's a mistake and how I can avoid making that mistake again in the future. But Jenna, I don't know if Pro Writing Aid is compatible with my software. I bet it is. Pro Writing Aid has more software integrations than any other software. I'm talking Google Docs, Word, Chrome, Scrivener, and more. You can try Pro Writing Aid out for free. However, if you're interested in the premium platform, which is the platform that I use, you can get 20% off by clicking the link in the description below. That's 20% off just for you because Pro Writing Aid is awesome like that. Click the link, you'll thank me later. On to the writing quirks. These are the 10 quirks that pop up the most in manuscripts, most of which Pro Writing Aid can help you with, I'm just saying. If you want even more writing and editing tips, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring that bell. I post videos on Wednesdays with bonus content on Mondays. And don't forget my dark fantasy novel, The Savior Sister, is currently available for pre-order in ebook, paperback, and hardback, plus I am hosting a huge pre-sale giveaway. Everyone who pre-orders a copy and enters my giveaway will receive a five-chapter teaser of The Savior Sister, plus you will be eligible to win a ton of prizes as well as some huge grand prizes. I have all the info in the description. Time for the quirks! those little bastards. Number one, filter words. Filter words are probably the most common writing quirk in existence. I don't know a single writer who hasn't struggled with them at some point. Filter words are words that filter the story through the character's experience. They essentially remind the reader that they're reading. But Jenna, of course they're reading. Yeah, but they're not supposed to know that. Reading is an immersive process. It can feel like you're experiencing the story firsthand. Filter words pump the brakes on this and you don't want to do that. There are a zillion filter words out there, but a few of the most obvious ones are see, hear, feel, think, and realize. When you go through your manuscript, pay attention to filter words and see if you can cut them out. For example, if you wrote, she realized her car was on fire, you could instead say, her car was on fire. Easy, right? Sometimes filter words are unavoidable, but nine times out of 10, they're probably unnecessary. Number two, crutch words. Crutch words are words we have a habit of using over and over again, even if there are better options. You may think you don't have any crutch words, but trust me, you do. The problem is we usually don't know what our crutch words are until someone else points them out. In my last manuscript, I used the word scurry so many times that one of my critique partners started to leave crab gifs all over the document. There is no avoiding this issue because it's an unconscious action. The best thing you can do is have someone read your work and point it out. Once your crutch words are on display, do a word search through your manuscript and replace them with synonyms. Number three, adverb. An adverb is more or less an adjective for a verb. They describe actions. A lot of writers crap on adverbs, but the truth is they're not inherently evil. They only become a problem when writers overuse them because they're not usually necessary since actions kind of already describe themselves. For example, if someone is running, you don't need to say they ran quickly because the act of running is quick. This is an extremely common quirk, but it's an easy one to break if you implement this single step. Do a search through your manuscript for every verb and adverb combo and ask yourself if the adverb is necessary. If your character smiles happily, the adverb is kinda useless because smiles are inherently happy. If your 
character smiles uncomfortably, then the adverb makes sense because the action is happening in a way that you wouldn't necessarily expect. If your character is smiling widely, sure, the adverb makes sense, but you know what would sound a lot better? If the character was grinning instead. A grin is a wide smile, and in this situation, you are ditching a weak verb and replacing it with a stronger, more accurate one. Number four, shifts in tense. When writing a book, you choose a tense, usually past or present, but some writers struggle with keeping it consistent. An example of this would be, she saw a bird. It is beautiful. Saw is past tense, is is present, Thus, we shifted, which is a no-no. If you're confused regarding how to spot shifts in tense, pay attention to the verbs. They will tell you all you need to know. Now, part of correcting this issue is understanding what isn't a shift in tense. The first and most obvious is if you are including dialogue or internal dialogue in a past tense book. In situations like this, the narrative should be past tense while the dialogue and thoughts should be present. An example of this would be, he stormed into the room and yelled, where is my brother? The next example revolves around good old present participles. A lot of amateur writers confuse the use of present participles as shifting tense, but that ain't true. For example, the sentence, he slowed down, stumbling forward, is past tense, despite the use of the word stumbling. Stumbling is a present participle, and though the use of the word present is in the term, it is not a shift in tense. This sentence is perfectly fine. If you're confused and want further explanation, comment below. I could make an entire video all about shifts in tense, what counts as a shift, and what doesn't. Number five, shifts in point of view. Shifts in points of view are exactly what they sound like. The story was told in one person's point of view, and now it shifts to someone else's point of view. But Jenna, that's how I'm writing my book. It's told from multiple perspectives. Then this doesn't apply to you, you big bag of beans. Shifts in points of view become a problem if the story is supposed to be told from one character's perspective. This is easy to avoid in first person novels because a shift would be blatantly obvious. However, in third person limited or third person deep novels, shifts are a lot harder to catch. If you're not sure what a shift in a third person novel would look like, here's an example. My book, The Savior's Champion, is told in third person deep from Tobias's perspective, which means the narration can only comment on what Tobias sees and experiences and thinks for himself. Tobias is aware that the queen of his realm is magical, but he doesn't know how her magic works. Thus, if the narration were to suddenly slip into an explanation of her powers, that would be considered a shift in point of view from third person deep to third person omniscient. The narration is explaining stuff Tobias has no knowledge of, which means we've left his brain completely. Number six, dialogue tags. Whoever said said is dead should be dead instead of said. A lot of writers, myself included, learned that said is dead in school and were encouraged to use dialogue tags like exclaimed, demanded, responded, or ejaculated. English teachers are dirty, rotten liars. Said is a great dialogue tag because it's invisible. Readers don't notice it, which makes the dialogue feel more natural. But Jenna, I can't just say said a million times on the page. It would be too repetitive. You're absolutely right, but you shouldn't need a million dialogue tags on the page regardless. Dialogue tags are only there to let the reader know who's speaking. If the reader can easily tell who is speaking based on the number of people involved in the conversation or the narrative surrounding the dialogue, then you don't need a tag at all. For the times you absolutely do need a tag, look at the line of dialogue and ask yourself, is the character speaking unusually, say in a whisper, mumble, or shout? In those situations, you can use the applicable dialogue tag. However, nine times out of 10, said is your best bet. Number seven, paragraphs. A lot of writers struggle with paragraph formation thanks once again to school. We are used to writing essays where paragraphs are formatted completely differently than novels. In essay writing, a paragraph has to be a minimum of six sentences. Anything shorter and you're losing points. In fiction, you'll see paragraphs that are three sentences or even one sentence. Hell, you'll see paragraphs that are one word. The general rule for paragraphs in fiction is simple. When the subject changes, the paragraph changes. If you are writing streams of dialogue, when the speaker changes, the paragraph changes. Two people should not have dialogue in the same paragraph. Do this and I will fight you. Number eight, repetition. This is one of the most common writing quirks I've come across in manuscripts. While crutch words refer to overusing a single word throughout the entire manuscript, 
Repetition refers to using the same word multiple times in close proximity. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a crutch word, it just means you're using it way too much within the same scene. Now there are going to be words you use a lot like the, uh, it, and, and. I'm not talking about that shit. I'm talking about whether or not you use the word pleased twice in the same paragraph, or whether you reference the staircase three times on the same page. This is another thing you could be unconscious of, so it may be hard to notice at first, which is why it's a good idea to have other people read your manuscript or to run your manuscript through ProWritingAid. Once your repeat words are pointed out, they can be replaced with synonyms or removed entirely. Number nine, internet speak. Sometimes slang, idioms, and even trendy capitalization and punctuation can sneak into our manuscripts. This is an extremely common quirk because sometimes we don't know that what we're writing is colloquial and it's especially common when it comes to internet speak. On the internet, we use capitalization to indicate emphasis, but in fiction, capitalization means screaming and italics mean emphasis. We don't use italics on the internet because it usually isn't available. Another perfect example of internet speak leaking into our writing is the interrobang. Interrobangs are informal, they are not a proper punctuation mark, and you'd really only use it in your writing if you were being intentionally irreverent. And number 10, homophones. Homophones are words that sound alike but have different meanings and are spelled differently. Obvious examples Examples are there, there, and there, and two, two, and two. These little assholes sneak into manuscripts all the time, especially if you're not well versed in their definitions. Again, critique partners and pro writing aid can help point these suckers out. However, if you want to ensure that this particular quirk doesn't become a recurring problem, you're going to need to learn their definitions. Understand what these words mean so you know when to use them. So that's all I got for you today. Thanks again to pro writing aid. If you need help during the self editing process, I can't cannot recommend them enough. Not only are they a grammar, spelling, and style checker, they can also help you learn how to improve and grow your craft. You can try them out for free or get 20% off your premium membership by clicking the link below. Click it. Do it now because I said so. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I post new videos on Wednesdays, and if you want to be alerted as soon as I upload, ring that bell. The Save Your Sister is available for pre-sale, an ebook, paperback, and hardback, plus I am holding a massive, enormous giveaway. You could win a bunch of prizes. You can get major teasers of The Save Your Sister. All the information is in the description below. And be sure to follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook, and of course, you could tweet me at Jenna Maressi. Bye! This is Wimbledon. If you haven't subscribed to Jenna's channel, then by all means, go for it. The people will love you for it. Go on. Press the button. Ding that bell. See you soon.